chapter three of um, of our book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. Uh, so chapter one was a sort of theoretical introduction called The Human Niche. Chapter two uh, comprised a deep history of, of the human lineage. And then in chapter three, we really get into the meat of the book. Chapters three through 13 take a system in turn. And chapters three and four are both kind of about um, the body and, and medicine. Um, so you know, rather apropos for what we are talking about here. I'm going to read just the very beginning of the chapter and... Um, and then a couple of paragraphs that are relevant to it um, a couple of pages later. Oh, just two, two and a half pages here. This is called Ancient, the chapter is called Ancient Bodies, Modern World. We've got a raptor out there calling. You hear that? Okay. Uh, the sun, the sand bushmen of Southern Africa, most of whom were hunter gatherers until just a few decades ago, have little trouble with the kinds of optical illusions that Westerners struggle with. Consider two identical lines, except that they have arrowheads at both ends going in opposite directions. This, incidentally, is called the muller liar illusion. And I can, for those of you at home, there's a thing there, um, but you can look that up. Um, consider two identical lines, except that they have arrowheads at both ends going in opposite directions. They appear to us to be different lengths, even though they are not. Our eyes fool us with help from our brains. When asked to do a simple task, assess which line is longer, we tend to fail. The sun do not. Were you to raise an American infant among the sun, though, that baby, once it grew up, would not have the same problem that her parents did with the optical illusion. Similarly, raise a sun child in Manhattan, and susceptibility to the illusion would again show itself. In this case, sensory capability and physiology are being driven by differences in experience and environment, not by genetic differences. Most readers of this, of this book likely live in weird countries, Western, educated, with a... Western nations with a highly educated populace and industrialized economic base that are relatively rich and democratic. As societies, we have benefited from industrialization and democracy, which have raised the quality of life for nearly everyone who lives in these countries. But there are many negative, unintended consequences downstream of society-wide changes. While it is clear to most people how much the 21st century weird environment has expanded the menu of possible experiences that we have at our beck and call, it is less obvious how 21st century weird life has curtailed other experiences, often to our detriment. What, why can we, unlike the sun, be fooled by a simple set of lines? It has to do with an alteration in our visual sphere. Our homes are clean, climate-controlled, and square. Just as depriving kittens of some visual inputs renders them less capable of seeing as adults, perhaps with our modern comforts and conveniences we are effectively depriving our weird selves and rendering ourselves less capable. Or perhaps our visual capacity is being tailored to our uniquely square environment. Either way, modernity is doing something to us at a deeply fundamental level, and the fact that we don't understand it is alarming. One thing we can be sure of is this. Models of human behavior and psychology, which tend to be based on empirical studies of weird undergraduate students, may well be accurate readings of the psychology and behavior of weird undergrads, but they do not inherently make for good models for the rest of the world. Indeed, it is now clear that we in the weird countries are outliers when it comes to many aspects of the human experience. The implications of this are far more important than being easily tricked by visual illusions, but understanding why we are susceptible to such illusions can provide insight into the risks of hypernovelty. It is likely that our highly geometric homes and playgrounds, which make up so much of what we see during early childhood, calibrate our eyes such that we suffer from such illusions far more than do those in the rest of the world. That geometry, which we mostly take for granted, emerged in part from being able to run wood through sawmills and create dimensional lumber. Most people, when their culture began to run wood through sawmills and build homes at the dimensional lumber that results, would not have thought to ask what, in our human experience and capability, might be affected by this. Dimensional lumber and the carpentered corners that result are novel features of the modern human's environment. How has it changed how we perceive the world? Reframing your approach to the world such that those questions do occur to you, even if you are not sure what the answers might be, is part of the goal of this book. And then just skipping together, skipping forward a couple of pages, if homes full of carpentered corners have made us more susceptible to particular kinds of optical illusions, altering our ability to see, what other costs to a weird lifestyle might exist? As recently as the 1990s, you would have been considered a crackpot if you had suggested that spending your workday sitting at a desk might have long-term effects on cardiovascular health or risk of type 2 diabetes. No longer. Carpentered corners create greater susceptibility to certain optical illusions. Over-reliance on chairs creates all manner of negative health outcomes. What, then, might deodorants and perfumes have done to our ability to smell the signals emitted by our bodies? What might lives filled with clocks have done to our sense of time? What have airplanes done to our sense of space or the internet to our sense of competence? What have maps done to our sense of direction or schools to our sense of family? 
So that is all in keeping with the rest of the conversation that we've been having. Absolutely. This I mean, is, it goes right to the issue of heuristics, which are built around the realities uh, uh, which you have in your developmental environment. And, uh, you know, the son live in a very different developmental environment. And so it's a, it's a trick that once you see that you're using these heuristics to great effect, but that they are actually contingent on being used in uh, environments in which the conclusions that they lead you to tend to be right and not wrong, um, a whole world opens up. Yeah. And this is not, this is certainly not a noble savage mistake that we're making, nor a looking at the past through rose colored glasses. Uh, it is, it is certainly true. And as we say elsewhere, I think in this chapter, even, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that antibiotics, vaccines, and surgery are three of the most remarkable feats of Western medicine. And the world is much better for all of them. That is true. And the fact that they are all of them, all of them over applied and used in places where they actually do harm is also true. And this again is not a, always wear your seatbelt in the car, stop asking questions sort of a thing. This is actually observing that. Uh, saying that something is a major advance and also questioning whether or not it should be ubiquitously applied blanket-like over every possible thing that happens, um, though you, you, you can have those two thoughts I think that's amazing, and I don't think it goes here in the same head at the same time. And in fact, we need to. We need to be having this conversation. Yeah. And in fact, even in the case of something like um, you just put on your seatbelt and don't think because it's much more likely to save your life than cost it, um, you might also think, well, what if I did get involved in the nuance discussion and I realized that rather than just bank on the ratio of these things, I would like to have a device that allows me to cut a seatbelt quickly if I cannot escape it in the car with you. So you get the benefit of the clicking the seatbelt automatically while retaining the ability to escape it if you cannot undo it mm -hmm. um, in a kind of accident that's unusual. And there are many of these things, you know, yeah. it, just because you think vaccines are the way doesn't mean you should be scoffing at ivermectin. That to me looks like a a business conclusion, not a medical conclusion. A medical conclusion mm -hmm. would have people who are enthusiastic about vaccines also enthusiastic about ivermectin. Um, so in any case, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's the discussion, stupid, right? <laughs> we have to have the discussion. That's yeah. the point. And, you know, does that mean that discussion is safe and won't cost lives? No, but it's a net question. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it isn't simply about lives either. There is there is a real question. I would argue, and I have not yet heard pushback on this, I would argue it does not make sense to sacrifice the lives of healthy young people in order to save older, unhealthy people. It just doesn't. It's yeah. not something a rational society does. You protect children. And so that means that the calculation is not a simple one in de under any circumstances. That's right. But we can do better. We can do better by discussing things. Yeah, we can. Yeah.